Going back to the series on a man in the land of Uz, Job chapter 4. And we're going to talk about how a greater than Job is here. Job 4.1, Then Eliphaz the Tamanite answered and said, Now Eliphaz, this is one of Job's friends, and with friends like Eliphaz, who needs enemies anyway? Up to this point, he's remained silent, which is the best thing you can do to comfort somebody in trouble who's in troubles. But Eliphaz says to Job, If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? So if we essay to commune with thee, essay like attempt or try to speak with thee, he's saying, Job, if we try to speak with you, will it only grieve you? You know, how can we keep ourselves from speaking to you in a situation like this? We've got a lot we want to say. And this is where he messes up. Some of the things that Eliphaz says will remind you of what they said to Jesus Christ. And there is one man that had it much harder than Job, and that was the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, ho that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You see, Job lost everything that he had. But Jesus Christ left everything that he had in heaven, came down, and went through trouble voluntarily. You know, Job had a lot to lose. And he didn't voluntarily have it all taken away. It just came about. The Lord had everything, way more than Job. He voluntarily left all of it to come down here. So a greater than Job is here for that reason. And a greater than Job is here who is the inventor of instruction. The Lord is the inventor of instruction. And Eliphaz says in verse 3 through 5, Behold, thou hast instructed many. He says to Job, Thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it's come upon thee, and thou faintest. It toucheth, toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Eliphaz is telling Job that he's instructed, strengthened, upheld the fa falling, and strengthened the feeble knees. But now the trouble has come to him. And in the eyes of Eliphaz, he isn't practicing what he preached. He don't believe Job is practicing what he preached. You see, because some things are easy to preach and hard to practice. This is true. But this isn't wise to speak these words to Job, who's going through such a mess. You see, Job, he did all these things. He instructed many. He strengthened many. He helped people. But now, the troubles come upon him. On him. And Eliphaz doesn't believe that he's doing like he was telling these other people to do, who he instructed. You see, the best thing for Eliphaz would, to do would be to just keep his mouth shut. Ecclesiastes 3, 7 says, A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Job gave a lot of instruction, but a greater than Job is here. Jesus Christ is the inventor of instruction. I mean, what do you use to instruct others? The Word. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Deuteronomy 4.36, Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice that he might instruct thee. Nehemiah 9.20, Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? You see, Jesus Christ is the only one who never needed instructions. He's the Word himself who spoke the words that we use for instruction. He's the inventor of it. Unlike Job, he had no problem practicing what he preached. He made all the rules... The Lord made all the rules. He came down to earth and showed man how it was done. 
And he never came out looking like a hypocrite. He never came out unable to practice what he preached. He never came out unable to do the things that he was re requiring man to do for all those thousands of years. In Hebrews 4.15 it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Eliphaz couldn't look at Jesus Christ and rightly accuse him of being a hypocrite are not able to do the things that he instructed others to do. And really, he had no right to say it to Job in this situation either. And maybe Job wasn't completely practicing what he preached to others who were in trouble. But who would? You see, when the tr trouble comes to you, you don't really know how you'll react until it does come. And see, a greater than Job is here because he is the embodiment of strength. In Job 4, 3 through 4, it says, Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast, in, thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. You see, Job helped a lot of people. He gave a lot of people strength. But Jesus Christ helped the whole world. In 1 John 2, 2, it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours, ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Lord strengthened. And in Romans 5, 6, it says, For we, when we were yet without strength, when me and you were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You see, the world's strongest man is without strength when it comes to death, sin, hell, and all eternity, if he doesn't get strength from Jesus Christ. He's the embodiment of strength. I got saved, and he gave me his strength. My flesh is subject to death, but my new man, it's got the same strength that the Lord Jesus Christ does because he gave me his. My, uh, the new man could beat death in an arm wrestling match because I received the strength of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the embodiment of strength. You receive him as your Savior, you receive it. You receive that strength. He carried the cross. The Lord carried the cross and put the sins of the whole world on his back. A greater than Samson is here. And a greater than Job is here because he is triumphant in trouble. It says in Job 4, 1 through 5, let's review back about what we've talked about. Then Eliphaz the Tamanite answered and said, If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be great? Be grieved, but who can withhold himself from speaking? Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it's come upon thee, and thou faintest. It toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. So Eliphaz, Job's horrible friend here, finally opens his mouth. You know, he asked permission to open his mouth. He says, he's like, who can not speak in a situation like this? And he, he lets Job know. He knows he's instructed many and strengthened people. But now all those troubles are come up on him, and now he's fainting. And Eliphaz is accusing Job of not being able to take the trouble that he has instructed others how to cope with. Any trouble you have faced, the Lord Jesus Christ has faced it. So a greater than Job is here. Any trouble Job is facing cannot be compared to what Jesus Christ went through during those hours on the cross. Because Jesus Christ took on an eternity, an eternity's worth of punishment. Jesus Christ took on eternity in hell's worth of punishment. And times that by every single man. Every single man. He took on every single man's eternity in hell when he was on the cross, even the men who wouldn't accept him. That's a lot of eternities. That's a lot of suffering and punishment in hell. How is that possible? Because with God, all things are possible. He, let, he, left, his, he left this trouble he was in triumphant. It, second, it says in 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks be unto God which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. It says in Colossians 2, 14 and 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, 
and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When the Lord was on the cross, he was in a spiritual battle that the physical man couldn't see. It was a battle of Jesus Christ versus Satan and the forces of darkness, and he came out triumphant in trouble. A greater than Job is here. A greater than Job is here that died the death of the wicked just to defeat the enemy. Eliphaz says to Job in Job 4, 6, Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and the uprightness of thy ways? Well, what is Job's fear, confidence, hope? It says in verse 7 and 8, Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Eliphaz is saying to Job, you know, remember. He says, remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent. Pretty much remember that you said that to people, Job. Remember what you said to the people when you instructed them. You said, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off. So Job taught that living innocent and righteous before God would add years to your life. And his fear was in God because he knew the Lord would have you reap what you sow. His fear and hope and confidence was in these things. He, he lived his life by these things. He lived his life believing that if you plow iniquity and sow wickedness, then you will reap bad things. That was his, his fear. That was his confidence and hope. Is, is those things and that if if you live righteously and innocent then you can expect years added to your life and that was even more so true in the Old Testament in Galatians 6, 7, and 8 it says be not deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting you will reap what you sow but Eliphaz is hinting that Job has been living wickedly. He's, been, he's hinting that Job hasn't been living righteously. Because why would, because if, that, if he were living righteously, according to Eliphaz, you know, why would you be in this mess? He's like, you gave all this advice that, you know, if you're innocent and righteous, you know, you're, you're going to live a long life. You honor your parents, you're going to live a long life. Or, you know, if you plow iniquity and, and sow wickedness, you're going to reap wickedness. But you see, Eliphaz is accusing of, these, of these things, but Eliphaz is ignoring the spiritual forces at work. He didn't see the scene in heaven that me and you saw back there in Job chapter 1 and 2. You have to be really careful about passing judgment on people because you don't know the whole story. You don't know the situation. You don't know why it is they're doing what they're doing or what they're facing. At this time, Job is suffering the consequences that a lost, wicked man faces when he reaps his wickedness. And it has Job laying flat on his back on the ground. This wasn't so for the Lord Jesus Christ. A greater than Job is here who suffered and died the death of the wicked so that he could defeat and laugh in the face of death. Have you ever thought about how cool that is? How awesome that is? How amazing that is? That Jesus Christ willingly, involuntarily died the death of the wicked just to rise from the grave so he could kill death. That's awesome. I mean, death was already mad about Enoch and Elijah, but they didn't defeat him. They didn't put a smudge on his record. The Lord defeated death and removed his stinger. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, it says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The Lord is the one who made Revelation 21, 4 possible, which says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. He defeated death. He voluntarily died. You see, Jesus would have just never sinned. He would have just lived forever in the flesh. He, he never would have died. 
he voluntarily died just so that he could kill death, defeat death, look death in the face and not let death hold him. And now he's alive forevermore. In Job 4, 7, it says, Remember, I pray, that whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Well, the Lord did. He died and he was innocent. But he got back up. In Job 4, 8, it says, Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Very true. But not something you want to say to a man literally on his deathbed like Job. Eliphaz is wrong about Job anyway. Job's not going through this because of some sin in his life. The Lord already said to Satan that Job was a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. The Lord is letting the devil attack Job because he's got confidence in him. So El Eliphaz is wrong about Job anyway. But a greater than Job is here who is going to turn the breath of life to breath of fire. You see, Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. He is the giver of life. He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. But one day that breath is going to turn into fire at the second coming. It says in Job 4.9, Eliphaz says in Job 4.9, By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. This is second coming prophecy right here. Because it, look, look at 2 Thessalonians 2.8. It says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume. Notice that word consume. The same word used in Job 4.9. Consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Look at Isaiah 11.4. It says, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. This is the same one who breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life. But that breath of life is going to turn into a breath of fire. All these people who rejected eternal life, they're going to get the breath of fire. 2 Samuel 22, 8 through 10, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also, and came down, and darkness was under his feet. See, at the second coming, he will come with flaming fire, taking vengeance. By the blast of God, they'll perish, and he will have a sharp two-edged sword that will proceed out of his mouth, and men on earth will be burned like an oven because of the fire proceeding from the Lord. It says in Job 4.10, Eliphaz says the roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. See, the devil, the roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour, becomes the one who is devoured. Job 4.11, the old lion perisheth for lack of prey and the stout lion's whelps are scattered abroad. Eliphaz is probably mainly referring to Job as the old lion by saying he perisheth because Job's pretty much on his deathbed and the whelps are the lion's children or Job's children. And Eliphaz seems to be referring to the fact that the lion's whelps have been scattered as they were back in chapter 1 when that wind came and killed the children of Job. But histor that's historically, that's probably what Eliphaz was referring to when he said the, in Job 4.9, By the blast of God they perish. And by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. You know, saying that wind was from the nostrils of God. Where it says in Job 1.19, And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and their dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. You know, Eliphaz is not holding anything back. He's a terrible comforter. He's giving Job a message that's saying pretty much it's all his fault and God's doing this to him because of his sins and his children were caught in the crosshairs of the blast of God's nostrils. That's basically what the message of a life as is. But when it comes to doctrinally, prophetically, that old line and those young lines, that's probably the devil and devils and they're going to get what's coming to them when Jesus Christ comes back. But Jesus Christ is greater than Job. He's going to come back. He's going to get vengeance on his adversaries. 
So greater than Job is here and sweet dreams to the wicked. If you're listening to this and you're lost and wicked, you don't have anything good coming for you. You got the second coming with the Lord coming back and flaming fire coming for you if you don't get saved. See, the offer's still out there. Take the breath of life. Don't wait for the breath of fire. But sweet dreams to the wicked. Eliphaz is about to tell Job about a dream that he had. I'm not so sure if the vision is from God or the devil, honestly. Either way, Eliphaz used it against Job. In Job 4, 12 and 13, it says, Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof, in thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men. Some, You see, sometimes you have some of the deepest thoughts when you're laying in your bed. He says, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. You see, when men see spirits in the Bible, they usually freak out in fear. Or like John, when John saw the glorified Christ, he fell at his feet as dead, and the, the Lord had to say, fear not. When Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall, he literally got so scared that his knees knocked. When Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord walking in the cool of the day, they ran and hid themselves. Eliphaz was scared during this dream because of this spirit that passed before his face. In Job 4.15, it says, Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It's kind of like when you thought you saw something walk right in front of you, out of the corner of your eyes, or maybe you're a victim of sleep paralysis, something like that. It says in Job 4.16 and 17, It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes there was silence and i heard a voice saying shall mortal man be more just than god shall the man be more pure than his maker it's as if eliphaz is using this vision to accuse job of thinking he is more just and more pure than god which seems to be foolishness because job was offering burnt offerings to god for his own sins and for his children's but the statement is true man can't be more just are more pure than God. But God made it to where a man can be as pure and as just. Because when I believed on Jesus Christ, he declared me righteous. He gave me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm saved. Because he's not looking at my own righteousness. But the righteousness he gave me by faith, which is the Lord's. A greater than Job is here. And it's Jesus Christ. Sweet dreams to the wicked if you're not going to get saved. It's going to be a nightmare. They can dream all they want. They can't bring in the kingdom. They can keep dreaming. They can create their own glorified body with transhumanism. They can keep dreaming and change the Bible to be their own final authority, but they will one day meet their maker, and they will never be as pure and as just as him. Shall a man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Not unless he gets saved. If he doesn't get saved, he doesn't defeat death. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return, it says in Genesis 3.19. So the next point is, another one bites the dust. Jesus Christ is greater than Job because Job's just going to go back to dust. His physical body is. It's going to be dust in the wind. You know, all we are is dust in the wind. As that song says, you're just dust in the wind. I'm not saying I'm for that song, but that's what came to mind. So another one bites the dust. Job 4.18, Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. If he can't trust the angels, then why would he put trust in the ones made a little lower than the angels, me and you? In Job 4.19, How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundations is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth, that's me and you. You know, his angels he charged with folly. The ones, you know, they... they came down and got with the women in Genesis 6 and partly what led to the flood of the whole earth because of all their wickedness. But you see, you're crushed, crushed before the moth. You live in houses of clay. Your foundation is in the dust. Everything you have gets corrupted by something as small as a moth. Your body can be eaten by worms. Your clothes wax old. Your vessel waxes old. It says, they are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. From morning to evening, people are dropping off like flies. If you think about it, every second a soul goes to hell. Just since this morning, there's no telling how many people have died, opened their eyes in hell, can never come back. 
But did it stop your day? Nope. People are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. One day you will die and it won't stop anyone's day other than the people around you and just the close ones. I mean, a young boy where I work died last Christmas. We still work the next day. Ice cream still got made. People went about their business. They don't talk about it anymore. It's like it never even happened. Job 4.21 Doth not their excellency which is in them go away? They die even without wisdom. It's like Eliphaz is saying, you know, Job, you've lost your wisdom. You've lost your excellency. And you're just dying like the miserable, wretched sinner that you are. You know, he's, this is a miserable comforter that Eliphaz is.